In this inspired insider.com interview, we talk with Kevin Rogers, one of the most sought after advertising copywriters online. He talks about his journey as a comic, a bellhop, a bartender, and then a copywriter. He talks about some of his secrets about copywriting and how it relates to his comedy days. He also reads a letter that he's never read before that he keeps on his wall. That and much more coming up now. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today I'm excited. We have Kevin Rogers, who's one of the titans of copywriting and direct response marketing. Kevin's one of the most sought after advertising copywriters online. He's the co-writer and strategist behind some of the most lucrative product launches in competitive niches like health and fitness, finance, internet marketing. He's written a campaign that became the number one hot topic on Alexa for a week and sold millions. He's consulted with some of the top people, different industries like Mike Dillard, Tom Venuto, which if you've ever heard of him, he will talk about that, and Tony Robbins, team, and much more. Kevin, thank you so much for being here. Jeremy, it's my pleasure, man. Um, and I'm excited to hear about your big lessons, mistakes, you know, you learned on your journey to success, what worked, what didn't work with copywriting, direct response, some of the tough, you know, tough lessons you learned. I always like to start off with a fun fact so people get to know you a little more personally. Right. What's a good fun fact that most people don't know about you? Hmm. Well, I'll tell you what's something interesting about me. Um, I was uh, born in Lowell, Massachusetts and uh, did a lot of traveling in my 20s. I, I was a stand-up comedian. And um, I got really into Jack Kerouac. And most people will know he's famous for writing the book On the Road. And I, I started really getting interested into the, in the beat movement. And I was born about 20 years too late for any of that. But it was really fascinating to me. And um, then somebody told me that Kerouac was, was from Lowell. I didn't even know that. And so I'm like, wow. And I really felt a kinship with him. And so then I was I end up living now in St. Petersburg, Florida, and, um, and this is the last place he lived. So uh, and I've performed comedy here and it's gone well and it's not gone well. And um, so I, I get to say I'm, I'm probably the only person alive who can say, like Jack Kerouac, I was born in, in Lowell and I've died in St. Pete. <laughs> Off, that's that's pretty amazing and often books influence us a lot how did that influence you in you know starting your career that book yeah that book yeah yeah well for me i mean i was i, was, I felt like i was living what i was reading in the book you know because uh traveling around and and you know um going great lengths to hook up with friends who are comics working in you know a town 100 miles away you'd get in the car after the gig and go you know what dude i'm just coming there and let's let's party and have fun and you don't get to see these guys and there wasn't skype and there wasn't cell phones and we you know we we made it around the country with a paper map man and like pay phones you know it's it seems totally archaic now but i i, I somehow never missed a gig um, so it, I don't know how that happened, but, uh, yeah. So yeah, when I read on the road, it just felt like the, the, you know, I guess the real kinship was not only the travel part and, and some of the solitude, but it was, I always felt like I was uh, like Sal paradise in the book, sort of the observer of everything happened on. I wasn't the nucleus of it, like the Dean Moriarty character, but I was really drawn to people like that. And I felt privileged to be in the presence of people who were just not, your average person whatsoever didn't fit into any normal societal situation. It was like the Blues Brothers go into the fancy restaurant to steal the uh, to steal the, uh, the, the the musician, you know. And so, um, yeah, that that's that's what inspired me. And um, you know, it was it was a, it was a unique experience that I'm, I'm I feel very blessed to have had. And I want to we'll dig into some of your comedy days too, and you know how that went. But I want to hear about. From growing up, what was a big influence for you? Well, growing up, you know, I think my mother um, just really um, uh, inspiring me to be myself and to and to be funny and be crazy. You know, if I if I had some little bit working, she'd always have me do it in front of her friends. 
do the thing, do the impression of uh, Jim from Taxi or something, <laughs> whatever it was. And, and I just, you know, the fact that she took such delight in it and even when I became a stand up. So that really inspired me. And um, as far the earliest I can remember being inspired about anything to do with copywriting or advertising, I remember going to see the movie, the Tom Hanks movie, uh, Nothing in Common, where he co-stars with Jackie Gleason, plays his dad. But in the movie, Hanks is an advertising guy and he's sitting around with the team and they're brainstorming commercial ideas and and you see the commercial kind of come to life a lot like you see on Mad Men now right and I just thought that has to be the greatest job in the world they're sitting there they get their feet up on desks they're, they're drinking too much coffee they're throwing pencils into the ceiling and they're you know coming up with creative cool ideas and watching it turn into something productive and i think that planted a seed pretty early in me so tell me this because i i don't know if it's a generalization most parents would be like okay you know this comedy thing's great but you know get serious but your mom encouraged you to do that what was it about you know kind of her background that um, or advice that she gave you that pushed you to do what you love to do that's a good question. Um, yeah, you know, I think my mom was the kind of person who she just uh, loved me and celebrated everything ab- about me. And you know? she she um, really loved to have fun and she loved to laugh. And she thought, you know, if I could make a living doing something that excited me and involved a lot of laughter, what could be better than that? Right. So it was a very natural thing. The truth is, if I decided to become an engineer she would have been just as supportive if 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 less amused (laughs) right right my dad on the other hand was the kind of guy who would i would call him from my third week on the road to to tell him about some great experience i had and he would listen and say wow that sounds really cool but are you going to look for a job when you when you get back to town and i'm like this i have a job i'm winning dad you know but he just couldn't, he was, and I was a father now, I get it. Like, you're, you're kind of scared that, uh, what if this doesn't work out? What's going to happen? And, um, and, you know, so, so I kind of had that yin and yang going. Right. But I think my dad not supporting me as much as I would have liked fueled me as much as the fact that my mom did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, he wants the best for you. And that's probably trying to protect you in a way. And, and so you have that yin and yang with your with your parents. And so how did you get started in the comedy then? Yeah, so I, um, you know, I was a skinny, awkward uh, kid in high school. Um, didn't get a lot of attention from girls. So like any uh, normal, um, healthy young man, that became my number one motivation was to figure out how to get girls to talk to me. Right. And um <laughs> and so I I found out I could make people laugh. And um, I really, I was, you know, just stealing bits early on for the most part. I mean, I remember as a kid making funny little recordings into my, my plastic red uh, cassette recorder and, and making up little skits and stuff. So I always had a, a, a penchant for it. But when I got into high school and we all it was a magic time because those Rodney Dangerfield comedy specials started coming out with people who went on to become legends, Seinfeld, Sam Kennison, Bill Hicks, you know, all these guys. And so we would memorize these routines and Howie Mandel had a great special, I think on HBO. And Eddie so Murphy, I think Eddie was, Murphy was emerging at yeah. that time and it was really exciting. And so, um, I, they, everybody would say, do the Mur- Eddie Murphy hunk, you know, and, and I would do it. And what was cool about it was, um, I, Sometimes it would kill and I'd go on for an hour and just doing different stuff. And that felt great, obviously. Uh, it does not get you with it, it, in the bed with girls, I can promise you. <laughs> it's total myth that girls want a funny guy. <laughs> they want it. They want him until they can push the off button and then go, you know, sleep with the, the, the mysterious guy. <laughs> but um, what was cool about it was I was learning the science of performing because I would realize instinctually, um, hmm, I did that same bit four nights ago at that one party and it killed and tonight it laid there. What did I do differently? I would know right away. You know, I changed that one word or I, I didn't really. I, yeah, I changed my vocal. And so, you know, that was, I think, my signal to myself that maybe there's something here that I can work with because I have an internal dialogue going. It's not just this. I, 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 I belch it out and hopefully something comes back. I was mm. 
I was really into the persuasion end of it even then, you know? Yeah, I mean, that also goes into public speaking too. What are a few things that you realize that you did that actually, once you flipped that switch, it actually worked a lot better? On stage as a comic, you mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know what I always had? I always had a lot of presence was my gift. I had a stage presence that kept people's attention. Um, I, I don't know what causes that or not causes that. I don't know that you can earn, you can earn that, but that was my gift because my jokes were terrible. I was just a goofy guy trying to get some laughs. People, but people liked me on stage. And another thing that you can't buy or manufacture is that people always used to tell me I reminded them of someone they knew and liked. So they'd say, "Man." I wish my cousin uh, Larry was here tonight. You look just like him. And, and the way you laugh is like just like his laugh. And I'd always think that's going to get me famous someday because if, if people immediately associate with you, then they got to show everybody, come look at this guy's like Larry. And, and, and we got to get Larry in here to see this guy. I thought, you know, that'll be like a viral effect. And, and maybe that I'll get famous, you know. <laughs> well, how did you hone in on your presence? Because you knew that was important. And when you have a comic come on, you know, they kind of have a real soft spoken presence or a loud presence. What was your like? How did you hone in your presence? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I just I t- I try not to overthink it. I just tried to for me, it was more about being in the moment. I was sort of a prowler. I would I really prowled the stage a lot. I like to I like to be on the move. Um, I learned to tame that a little bit. Chris, Chris Rock's a famous prowler and it works for him. It can it can be distracting sometimes, but you Um, I always liked the motion of it. There are guys who are masterful at standing still, never touching the mic. Well, he kind of holds it, but a guy like Stephen Wright, I mean, that's what this is so great about comedy. There's no rule. There's no reason why it works or doesn't work. It just you have to be yourself and do your thing. And for me, it was just about, you know, how uh, how in the moment can I be? That's what would excite me. If, if If I ever got into a place where I just was repeating the jokes and it was sort of like I'm phoning in my act for my for my money Th- that sucked and I would always try to force myself out of that that feeling by by doing something daring that I wasn't sure about yeah so what else helped in your delivery because I remember watching you um, I saw the video of, of your Sam talk and one of the funny parts which I was like laughing out loud last night like two in the morning was um, when you you showed the letter of your daughter and then at the end, you kind of throw in, and she's 20, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's just a funny bit. That's just a, what so, we call misdirection, you know, in, in comedy. So, the, uh, you know, I, it, it was just such an easy thing. And, you know, it was funny. It, it really happened. My wife texted me that picture. She, um, and I put it in the slide like two hours before I, I went on stage. And um, it was this, you know, my daughter was four at the time or something or five. And it was like a poorly written, <laughs> you know, letter. Some letters were backwards and it yeah. said, you know, something really sweet, though. And, and I thought this is a great way to bring everybody into a real moment. And I said, you know, I just want to remind everybody to congratulate yourselves for getting on a plane and coming here because this is what we're, we've all given up. Look at this. My w- wife just texted me this note from my daughter and they see it on the screen and that obviously it's a, a written it looks like a child and i read it and they go ah and i go i go well she's 20 so right. so it's not as sweet as you think and, and this is hilarious because suddenly not only is that a, a funny gag but it suddenly it, it establishes to the crowd that i'm not going to take anything too seriously up here and everything's up for grabs and yeah. that's what i love about a moment like that yeah and we're going to draw some of the parallels you do a good job you know drawing the parallels between comedy and copywriting so in that respect, what was your first, you know, comedy gig like? Wow, the very first one. I mean, the funny story behind it is that I, I told you I was getting a reputation in my, my little circle as the funny guy, right? So my friends kept saying, dude, you got to go on stage. You got to go on stage. You got to go on stage. And I, I thought, all right, I kind of took the dare. So I decide I'm going to do this, and I call, I call up the com. I'm 18 years old. I call up the comedy club, and I said, "Hey, I want to do the open mic. What do I, how, how does that work?" And they said, "Well, just come on in and put your name on a list." I said, "Well, I'm only 18. Do you have to be 21 to do it?" And they go, uh, "No, nah, just don't drink." <laughs> and I go, "Okay." Um, I go, um, well, "How long do I get? Like 20 minutes?" The guy goes. 
20 minutes? You'd be lucky to get five. I go, five minutes? What am I going to do in five minutes? <laughs> I'm like arguing with the guy. I've never, never been in a, on a stage in my life. And he's like, just come in and put your name on the list. And of course, I get on stage thinking, uh, you know, five minutes, come on. I think I did three and a half. You know, I couldn't see. I was sweating. I literally, all I could do was hope, try to remember the words I was supposed to say and listen for anything that sounded like a positive <laughs> response. And of course, I had a table of friends there, so that helped a lot. And um, it was just the, the, the greatest rush I've ever experienced. Uh, so the first one's really just about getting through it, you know? And, and I did. I was hooked immediately. I couldn't wait to go back on stage. And I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, I, I, I started hanging out at the club immediately. And so a couple of weeks later, I was there on a it wasn't the open mic night. I'd been on stage twice and done OK. And the, the, the guy who's still a dear friend of mine was the MC, And he said, hey, do you want to do a set? I wasn't expecting it. And I was like, yeah, of course. So he brought me up and I just assumed it was going to go great again. And I tanked. I completely tanked. And um, and he, he goes, uh, I, I was waiting for him when he came off stage. And I go, what 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 happened? He goes, you took it for granted, kid. He goes, you know, you, you, you phoned it in. He goes, uh, he goes you, you won't do that again. <laughs> and he was right. It was like, I just went up. I was already cocky in like my third or fourth time doing it. And I took it for granted that, what like I said about being in the moment. And, uh, and, and I learned quickly that if you're not engaged, man, the crowd will, will let you know. There's probably a fine line, though, between taking it for granted and not. What was it that in your mindset that made you take it for granted? Because I think we do that in our everyday lives, too. Yeah. Th and don't realize it. We do. We, we, you know, we get cocky and we just we forget that there's a um, um, process to getting good at something, I think. Right. And then we um, as entrepreneurs and as uh, freelance artists and as business people, people come to us because they know we're good at a certain thing. And um, I think we forget that there's there's a checklist. There's a process to every scenario that needs to be followed. And when you get uh, too good at it and start to blow off that checklist, that's when things get broken. So what do you and do in your mindset now to get ready for either copywriting or then to get ready for that that show? You know, for me, it's it's research. Um, I don't know if you have you done your your Colby personality test. You know, the, the Colby assessment. Um, I'm an eight four 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 on the on the Colby, which is kind of an interesting uh, result. And so, it, it, I didn't wouldn't have guessed that, but um, it's pretty accurate. The eight is, you know, I'm a fact man. I need the research. So for me, it's about really digging in, doing a lot of research, finding examples of what's worked, what hasn't worked. And, you know, once as a copywriter, once you've done all this research and it's just it's you want it bubbling out of you. And so you do what, what John Carlton calls stalking the desk. You know, it's like you're just stalking the desk and you're like ready to go in and, and, and fight the battle. And it's like, let me at it. I, I'm ready to write this copy rather than sitting there going, oh, God, what, where do I start? Who cares about this? You know, you just got to, you know, fill your head with so much stuff that it, it, it's just pouring out of you when you sit down to write. If it feels like you're trying to pull it out of yourself, you haven't done enough research. That, that's that's all writer's block really is, is a lack of, of preparation. Yeah, yeah. And I want to find out about how you got then transitioned to copywriting. But what are some of those tough moments? Because you did comedy for a long time. Yeah, almost a decade. Yeah. Yeah. So what were some of the tough times or things you had to overcome in in the comedy career? Um, well, I think, you know, money was never there. Um, but it's funny how we focus so much on money and you look back to a great time in your life and you go, it didn't seem to matter. You know, it's like, yeah, I was broke. I, I never had excess, but God, what a rich life it was, you know? Um, so for me, I guess it was essentially the biggest problem was not feeling like I had any control over it. And the lesson I learned later was, man, if I had known anything about business or even just at least embraced the idea of business as a, as a rule of life, I was anti-business. I was anti-capitalism. I thought everybody with money w was was an asshole and that they got it by by ill means and weren't to be trusted. I don't know where I got that. I just, you know, being attracted to counterculture and, and 
you know, hippiedom as a kid. And I just thought you couldn't create art if commerce was your goal. Mm -hmm. And now I get that it, it's, it surely can be done uh, with, with a nice balance of both. So, you know, my big lesson was that, um, you know, um, yeah, you, 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 you can be an artist and get paid well for it and everybody can be better off for that. So what would you go back and tell the young Kevin at that time? I'd say, dude, you know, um, spend uh, as much effort as it would take to be a mail carrier on actually furthering your career with some sort of plan you're following uh, instead of sleeping till 4.30 in the afternoon every day. How about waking up at 2.00? And spending two hours, you know, um, actually working on your career, um, and um, and and you know, yeah, that's because someone what I listening may be in that situation, right? And so, what would you tell them to spend that two hours on to further, or you, for you, for instance, at that time, what would you have spent that two hours doing to further your career? I would have, um, well, I would have written jokes. I would have spent at least an hour. I mean, one hour a day. Go through the newspaper and just develop the writing muscle. The, the, the worst habit we all get into is just being lazy, just being la lazy, taking it for granted. And that leads to complacency and that leads to um, bitterness, right? And disillusionment. And you know what I found out about myself is, um, and I think everybody, if they think about this, will realize the same thing. The only you time you feel really energized and excited is when you're out of your comfort zone and when you're challenged. You know, it's important to have a comfort zone and go back there for, for solace at, at, at different times. But if you're starting to feel, uh, you, you know, mushy <laughs> uh, and, and uninspired, whether it's physically, whether it's emotionally, you need to challenge yourself and scare, scare yourself, man. If, you're, if you haven't been nervous in a long time, then you're screwing something up, man. Put yourself in a position to be nervous and that's when you'll get results. I mean, that's true. That's true. And I find like a lot of high level entrepreneurs will do like adventure trips or something just to get themselves out of that comfort zone. I guess another one is just to get on stage for people who aren't uh, used to it. But did you accomplish your main goal with, with comedy, which is to get women? <laughs> it, 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 there, were, there were times, you know, I, I, I had a good look working, let's say, you know, uh, I had the long hair, I really had the rock star thing kind of nailed. And so there were opportunities. Um, and, and you know, what's funny is sometimes I look back and I go, man, you know, I was single and there were no rules. And I am going to send this link to your wife. So, so just be careful what you say. No, no yeah, she knows. I've told her, I said, you know, um, I, I'm perfectly happy, happily married now, but you know, um, I, that was all my chance to, to do anything I wanted to do. And um, you know what the truth was, though? Even then, I was, I was sort of an introvert, and I really liked my time alone, and I, I don't like drama. And so I, I would defer to uh, the comfort zone a little in those scenarios. If somebody came up and made a very wild proposition to me, yeah, I'd go for it sometimes, but for the most part, I'd be like, yeah, this is going to end in handcuffs or... <laughs> Or, you know, a stabbing of some sort that I probably don't want on my But mind. then you could use it your next your next. I know, day. but, that, you know, that's the thing. And that's why they're, they're, those comics, if they get to live long enough, have the best stories. <laughs> and kind of like copywriting, how did you come up with your, your bits that you were going to do? It was always, uh, I was a storyteller even then, right? And um, so I would take a scenario that happened to me and then I would you know, really make it as colorful as I, as, as I could. It was probably more akin to screenwriting or uh, sitcom script writing than it was your, your average stand-up. Like, my stuff wouldn't be hilarious on paper. It was, it was how I presented it. So, for instance, um, I had a joke about, um, I won't be able to remember it enough to do it, but the scenario was I was watching the news and it got eaten by an alligator. And it, it, it's always so sad. And you think, how, how the hell could that happen? Like, how does this happen? And then you see the interview with the parent. And he's like, oh, man, he was messed up from the get go. And uh, he just come down here. To, he, just wanted, he just wanted to pet that thing. And, <laughs> you, know, and you know, and then so it's funny because you, you just act out the scenario. And it, it was, you know, so you realize it's not so strange. <laughs> exactly right. You're like, oh, well, that's how I, that's how it happens, you know. 
And then the scene takes it takes off in weird ways from there. And what I loved about doing performing comedy that way is if you set up the scenario, depending on how good the crowd was and how in the moment you were, that's where the magic would happen. You would go off on tangents that you weren't expecting and add a whole new hunk to the bit, even if for only that night. And those those were the nights you would kill and people would double over with laughter because just like you would with friends at a party, that's when it's You're funny. Feeding it's off of them it's too. happening right now, yeah. right? You can, they can only laugh so hard when you're repeating words that you know are funny at them. But when you're in the moment with them and the unexpected is happening and everybody has a sense that where the hell is this going, including the comic, that's the gut laugh. Yeah. So was your process looking at what was happening in the news? Did you? Because I know a lot of you know comics do self defamation. What? Um, where did yeah. you get your material? Yeah, was, I guess? I had sort of a self-deprecating thing. You know, it wasn't like a Brian Regan level of I'm always the idiot in this scenario. Um, I, I, I was more about, um, it wasn't so much in the news. You know, I talked a lot about, you know, I, I did a lot of drug jokes, a lot of, you know, I was a stoner at the time. And uh, so I did a lot of pot jokes. The greatest thing ever was, you know, in the, like a year into my career, I got to open for Tommy Chong when he did his first solo tour, his first week ever in a club as a solo artist. And I got to open for him. Wow. And I had all these, I had this long hair and I had these, all these pot jokes. Oh, it was and, heaven. And for people who don't know, that's from Cheech and Chong, right? Yeah, Cheech, yeah. Cheech and yes. Chong. Yeah, still a legend, still out there. Brilliant guy. Um, Tommy's the guy who was a cellmate with uh, Jordan Belfort and, and inspired him to oh, write really? Wall Street. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's a guy, again, there's a guy with a legendary career who just goes into these scenarios being Tommy. So he was a great guy. And um, anyway, so, uh, yeah, I, I, again, it was scenarios. So whether it's like, you know, I'm high and this is what's happening and that's why it's funny um, or, you know, um, whatever the scenario was, that was my inspiration. But I, I wouldn't go off the news. You know, I'm, I'm kind of glad in the end I did later in life become a writer for a syndicated column that was all jokes based on the daily news, which is a fun exercise, a great way to learn to write humor. But it was an advantage as a stand up not to develop a news newsy jokes because they had a, a shelf life. You know, and, and I asked this, too, and um, I want to get into the copywriting, but I feel that this all this applies so much to copywriting that I have to touch on it is when you were sure. doing the comedy, the people you were working alongside, who, is, who are some people that actually end up making comedy their career and, and made it big? And what do you think separated them from, from you? Because I find there's not that, I don't know, not that much huge difference. And same thing online, people find, well, there's not much that separates me from, from this other person who actually mm -hmm. made it big. So who are some of the people that you grew up in comedy with that ended up, you know, yeah. do, making it big. Great question. Well, the best example is a guy who's still one of my best friends in the world named Billy Gardell. Billy I'm a is, big fan. Yeah. Are you? Oh, yeah, man, yeah. Billy's a great comic. He's the star of Mike and Molly on CBS. Yeah. I'm in Billy's Chicago star. too, so it makes it even more hit that's, home. That's, yeah. right. Yeah. that's right. That's right. And, 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 you know, Billy just did an episode of um, uh, uh, WTF with Mark Maron, by the way, which is the most candid I've ever heard him. So, if you want to know all about Billy, check that out. Um, so Billy and I both started at the same age. Uh, we were both high school dropouts who got into stand-up comedy at about 17. And he, he, was, he was sort of the hot shot in Orlando, and I was sort of the hot shot in Clearwater. And we'd heard about each other, and we had some mutual friends. And we should have been you – know, Florida Comics – especially in the 90s, had a reputation for being really edgy and really hardcore. I didn't realize until even later that sometimes being from Florida was a disadvantage. Like the headliner would go, oh, God, I got a Florida middle. I'm, I'm in trouble this week because we were raunchy and dirty and out for blood. We, it was all about how hard can you kill that crowd? And you weren't never allowed to do anything that was like a hack joke. Uh, you know, a, a pun, anything easy, you would get slaughtered by the other comics. We were hardcore guys. So Billy and I should have been c competitors and probably viewed each other as some, something of an enemy. But for some reason, when we finally met, we, uh, we just became, we hit it off immediately and we, we were vulnerable with each other. 
in in, in, in a way that wasn't normal for for guys in that group. And so we hit it off right away. And like we, how? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. It was weird. You know, we, we, we had this other guy that we really looked up to named Tom Rhodes, who's another legendary comic. This guy's been all over the world. His passport is this thick. He's led an amazing career. He's a great comic. But Tom was our hero. And um, Tom was a really cool guy. And whatever Tom was into, you, were, you needed to be into. And you needed to know as much about it as Tom did or you'd kind of get your balls busted, right? So Tom was very into the doors. And Jim Morrison, he had this whole Jim Morrison thing going. And um, Billy and I were in a room and, and the doors were playing and we were the only guys in there. And a song came on and, and Billy, it, it's, it seems so simple at the time, but you know how peer pressure can be. Billy said, oh, this is a good song. He goes, he goes what, what is this song called? Is this Peace Frog? That's a, you know, and I go, yeah, I, I think it is Peace Frog. And just... Him not just him admitting he didn't know everything about the doors, and I, he just opened himself up that much instead of having to posture and be the cool guy or be and pretend shut up. that he knew. Yeah, and it was like in that little moment we went, dude, we're, we can trust each other, can't we? Like we both get that we're insecure about all this and just trying to figure it out. So let's let's always be honest with each other. And 25 years later, that's how our relationship is. It's it's a magical thing. So the difference is. Billy and I were on parallel paths. We were both kicking ass. We were both the best middle acts you were ever going to see. And then uh, I'll tell you the, the crossroads. Billy decided he had a business sense. All right. And, and Billy decided he was going to become a headliner in the clubs or he wasn't going to work. He signed with a manager named Chris DePetta, who he's still with uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And that Chris told him. Okay, number one rule, you're no longer a feature ever. Sit, at your, sit and starve uh, unless you headline. And that was crazy to me because I thought it was the crime of the century. If I could, somebody offered me $350 to go do three nights and I could eat that week and pay my rent and get to the next gig, I'm winning. Billy realized, no, I'm going to be stuck here forever if I don't do this. So he turned down work, which is the most unnatural, counterintuitive thing a comic can do. He painted houses, he did grunt work, he did whatever he had to do to make the rent until people offered him headlining work. And it only took like two months. And then, yeah, it was scary to go headline all of a sudden, but he grew into the role quickly and that's been the difference. That's why he has a career today and uh, my career as a stand-up ended uh, you know, within, within seven to 10 years. And I'm, I'm glad for that. But that is the defining moment where he made he made a business decision and I just kept taking the easy money. Yeah. Yeah. So then what transitioned you to copywriting? Yeah. So that was luck in, in some weird or, or some greater mission that I'm not aware of. Um, I, I was doing this awkward transition out of stand up into, you know, the legitimate working world. That's and it tough because your schedule is just way different. Well, yeah, in your work ethic, I mean, I'm used to like showing up, being fawned on, getting free drinks and then sleeping as late as I want the next day. But uh, I was I was always, you know, I was I was I'm, a, I'm a sort of a pleaser. So I always wanted to do good, whatever scenario I was in. So sh arriving to the gig on time and, and working hard wasn't a problem for me. The problem was I had no resume, you know, all of a sudden. Everything that was really interesting to people, like, wow, you, you're a comic. No kidding. Tell me all about that. Suddenly, you say that in a job interview, and people are, they might be interested, but they immediately realize they're not going to hire you because you're probably looking for work as a comic, not a bellman. <laughs> so um, I had to take these no resume jobs. I, I actually went to bartending school, ABC bartending school, and it was actually really good. Um, they learned, taught me how to make the drinks and, um, they actually had to fulfill their promise on job placement. They got me like three or four jobs that just were not a good fit. My God, I'm like the worst waiter you can imagine, you know, and, and wearing like a uniform was, was really bad for me. And then I, um, you know what I learned though? You, you have to just be doing something, you, you know, like you have just momentum, you know, you, you keep walking and, and, and somehow you'll find out where you're supposed to be. I lucked out and, and, and a friend got me a job at the second oldest tavern in the city of Chicago called Marge's uh, in Old Town. It's, today it's called Marge's Still. because But I, when I worked there, Marge's... So you were in Chicago? 
Yeah, I was in Chicago. Oh, I didn't yeah, know yeah. that. Okay. I, I retired from comedy in Chicago. Oh, okay. That's right, yeah. In Old Town. And so um, that was a great, colorful uh, thing to do. And again, I was slowly learning business now because like every every transaction with a customer between a bartender and a, and a patron is there's a bit of a hustle going on there and there's a, there's a relationship and you know, it's all about, there's immediate, um, you know, a conversion rate, like how well did I get tipped and why, like, or how did I screw that up? You know? So I was slowly learning business through these real world world jobs. It probably helped me that I had no resume and couldn't go sit in some cubicle or work in some, I would have learned nothing doing that, but I had to hustle. So I did bartending. I was a bellman, which is another great. There's a lot of parallels between writing copy and hustling as a bellman. And um, and like then what? so I don't well, for instance, you know, being a bellman, like a good bellman, you 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 don't make your money on the tip you get for bringing somebody's um, luggage to their room, uh, unless it's like checkout day and it's like a 300 people are leaving the hotel. Then that's all you can do. But the real way you make money as a, as a bellman is by it's it's the ride up um, in the elevator as you're checking people into their room. That's there, there's a there's a sales pitch going on there because that's your opportunity to find out who they are, where they're from, why they're in town and what they want. What is it you're after? If it's a family of four, you're playing nice with the kids. You're 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 showing that you're a good guy, and you're going, "Hey, if you guys, what, what do you plan to do when you're here? Oh, we're, we're going to go to this park and that park. Hey, you know what? I know a guy. Let me let me hook you up with, with some discount passes, or let me know if you need a car out there because parking sucks. And so now I'm getting a cut from the guy who drives the car. They're tipping me better because they're happy. You're just your problem solution, problem solution. If it's a businessman who's you can tell wants to go to the strip club, you hook him up with that. Hey, don't don't drink a drive. You don't want to. You don't want anybody finding out you were there. Let me hook you up with a car. Let me call the club. Uh, uh, you know, I'll make sure you get taken care of. It's a hustle, man, yeah. and it's great. It's a lot of fun. So. I was learning business. Where yeah. None of that applied in, in, in comedy. Suddenly, I was forced. If I wanted to make some money, I had to learn how to hustle. And so quickly, um, I ended up in a scenario where a, a guy I knew from comedy started a marketing business, and he hired me on character. He said, look, you don't know anything about this business, but I know I can trust you, and I don't have that with anybody else in this company. Um, so I'm going to pay you, I think it was 500 bucks a week, to come here and sit next to me and figure out how this works, and 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 I'll teach you. I can. Tr I know. I'm I'm paying for your trust. I'll teach you the rest. Pretty good scenario. How to refuse? Wasn't my environment. Didn't like it. Hardcore phone dog salespeople, telemarketing crap. Didn't like the environment at all. But it forced me very quickly to learn business because I couldn't turn down the money. And three months later, the guy told me uh, his doctor uh, told him if he didn't take some time off he was going to die of stress well, he threw me literally threw me the keys to his business and said you're in charge and walked out the door and it was one of those moments where i could either leave but i was already trapped in, and he gave me a raise to like 800 bucks a week or something and it was like i had a, had a young baby at home i was like <laughs> this is happening for a reason and i figured out how to run a, a business and run a a, a a room of hardcore largely drug addicted telephone salespeople who were manipulators by by rule and they all tried every trick in the book to to get over on me and to get away with stuff and it was a fast crash course in management and a compliance and selling i had to sell them and and it, it was it was fascinating i wouldn't trade it but it was it was it was stressful, stressful. <laughs> and this was with this was with uh, Chris, and that's where I met. And so that company ended up hiring Chris Tomasulo, who's a great marketer, a, a great student of direct response, um, to uh, to create an inbound program f for them. And Chris and I hit it off. And Chris realized I wasn't thrilled with with the job I was doing, and he knew I loved to write. And so Chris said to me you should look into copywriting. I bet you'd be a good copywriter. And I, I didn't know what the hell that meant. So he showed me a sales letter. Uh, I thought it was the stupidest, ugliest thing I'd ever seen. And I said, who in the hell would ever read this, let alone do what it's asking? He explained to me that it was ugly on purpose. 
and started to unpack all the persuasion that was going on in the sales letter and hip me to people like Gary Halbert and John Carlton and Dan Kennedy. And I started reading books and I, I got really excited. I mean, you know, my skin used to tingle when I would read John Carlton's blog post and I would read good sales letters. And I just knew that was a sign that I had somehow found the thing where everything I do know can, can now be used to do great things. And it, it, it was an exciting time. What was some of those things, Kevin, that you remember that Chris explained that opened your eyes that wasn't just some ugly, poorly written sales letter? Um, he showed me what was on the other side of it. And he, he showed me what the desire of the, of the person reading was. First of all, he, he explained to me that it's not for you. Uh, this what is was it? Do you remember what that first one was? I think the first one was actually an invitation uh, for a coaching group that he had. And it was for entrepreneurs and direct response marketers. And he had, Chris is a, a, a persuasion you know, master. And um, it was all about persuasion. And I didn't understand any of that. And I just thought, none of this appeals to me. And I just thought, an ad was supposed to get anybody who reads it to want the product. And he said, well, it's, it, it's not written for you because you don't understand what any of this is yet, right? Mm -hmm. But the people who are into it, this means a lot to them. And, and, and so that made sense to me. And I, the first thing I, he, t he explained to me that made it all made sense was he told me there was a guy who made a, a million dollars a year teaching carpet cleaners how to make more money cleaning carpets. And at first I thought, well, that's crazy. And, but then he said, well, let me, uh, he said, these people pay $25,000 a year to go sit with this guy three or four times a year and to have him t tell them what works, what will get them more business. And he said, and I said, that, that's outrageous. How much can a carpet cleaner make? He said, well, the smart ones who pay this guy 25 grand make probably 10 times that back for the money. So doesn't that make sense? And I thought, well, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Of course, he was talking about Joe Polish and, you know, um, friends with Joe and Dean. It's, you know, and, and so it just started making sense to me that if, if you could really solve a problem for even a small percentage of a, a particular industry, then you could make a lot of money by helping them make a lot of money. And, and that made sense to me. And so then everything just started to come together. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, I love that story. And so, Kevin, also you talk about um, then transition from the job to then freelancing. How mm -hmm. hard was that? Um, yeah, that was tough. That was tough. Um, well, because I had two problems. One was I was studying copy and um, practicing copy, but I had zero idea how to get a client. Uh, the second problem was I was making a pretty good salary at that company, even though I would have to do breathing techniques just to get from my car to the door. Uh, I was so, what was stressful about it? Just the, uh, just so I can picture Have you it. seen the movie Boiler Room? Yeah, yeah. Okay, imagine being a, a mild-mannered, kind of a you know, nice guy. Um, John Carlton gave me a quote yesterday in a personal call that was really revealing to me. He said, I want you to write this down and I want you to pin it to your wall. Being a good person is a disadvantage in business. <laughs> and it's it's true. I guess I'm now, screwed. <laughs> you, well, here's the yeah. thing. It doesn't mean you can't yeah. do just as well as other people, but you have to understand that it's going to take longer and it's going to hurt sometimes. Mm -hmm. And we feel things on levels that other types of business people don't feel. I could not go to toe to toe with uh, Mr. Wonderful on Shark Tank. I don't. I don't work the way that guy works. You know. Uh, and I, so, <laughs> um, I'm sorry. The question was, uh, oh, transitioning. Yeah, so, yeah. so, um, um, yeah. The, oh, you asked me what was hard about that job. So imagine boiler room. Literally, these hardcore drug addicted, drama filled. Um, people that I have to now try to control. And so, you know, it, it was it, it was an exciting challenge for a while. And then you, I just got burned out on the whole process. Nothing was new or challenging anymore. It was the same old, oh, God, 
you know, one guy would have a great week and make a lot of sales and you knew he was not going to be back for two weeks because he's an independent contractor and there's nothing I can do about it. And he's going to go, you know, uh, you know, go snort, spend it snort and, all that money. And then when he's broke again, he'll be back and he'll be desperate and he'll ask for a loan and, and all the same crap. So it was just, you know, there was no order. There was it was very hard to, to, mm -hmm. to establish and maintain order the way that company was structured. It's not how I would structure a company, but it wasn't my company. I was just kind of helping run it. And so, you know, it was just a lot of, it was just not me and it was not my element. It, it, it taught me a lot about what I could do and what I could be in ways that I wouldn't have thought, but it also taught me a lot about how I would never want to be in scenarios that I never need to be in because they're, I'm just not built for them. Yeah, and so when you transition, because I feel like a lot of people, you know, they may be in something that's very highly stressful, they want to transition, but the transition is is uncertain. And yeah. and I think you said that you had a, a wife, you had children. So how yeah. did you make that leap? Yeah, so yeah, and I had I had to replace, I would say it was make like 65K a year, you know, and it was like, I, I couldn't, quit that job until I could replace that income. And as a rookie freelance copywriter to, you know, aim for six figures is a pretty lofty goal. And uh, but you're cocky, I, so it's okay. Uh, yeah, I guess I am. I'm more cocky than I realize. <laughs> and, it, and it happened, you know, there's something to the law of attraction. I don't know exactly what it is. And I know it, it gets, it gets bastardized because people, you know, uh, deduce it to you think happy thoughts and good things happen but I, I, that movie the secret came out around this time and i did the thing with the dollar bill where i wrote the the zeros after the one and made it a hundred thousand dollar bill and that year after i did that uh i got so i, I made ninety seven thousand dollars i almost got to the six figures and i, I said this is obviously i i had to work diligently yeah, yeah. so what did you do in that time so what I did was, uh, I, again, you have to have a mentor. You, the only way for me and that I've ever seen with anybody is you, somebody who has more work than they can handle needs to trust you enough to give you some of that work. That's how you get started as a freelancer. Some, somebody has to, you have to get into somebody's good graces who can give you work and then hopefully watch your back so you don't screw it up completely in the beginning. That's how you start as a freelancer. Uh, hanging out a shingle, you know, optimizing your LinkedIn page, all those things, I guess, I guess can be effective. To me, it's all about networking and connections. It's yeah. the only way to get a jump. So who are some of your mentors? So my first mentor was a guy named Vin Montello, who was a uh, uh, same scenario as me, a fellow stand up comic who back when I first started was already kind of a legend because he had moved to Hollywood to become a screenwriter. And He'd been on the hustle out in Hollywood writing scripts. He wrote for uh, network uh, shows like Rugrats, and he was a, a, oh, wow. a, a yeah, brilliant comedy writer. Vin Montello, you, you should have Vin on, and he's, he's a great guy to talk to, really oh, interesting definitely. guy. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, total fluke, I learned um, through a chain email <laughs> that Vin was reading Michael Masterson's um, copywriting course. And I was, I had read that book and, and so I reached out to Vin and we hadn't spoken years and it turned out he was, you know, uh, really engaged in the process of getting jobs and he was working with some clients. So he helped me kind of fake my way into my first few jobs. Um, nothing nefarious. It's just that I had to, um, figure the first job I ever did, the guy wanted an autoresponder series and I was like, yeah, I can do that. And then I went to Vin and I was like, what's an autoresponder? I had no idea, and he, and and it's a certain so lingo, figured, yeah. Figured yeah. out how to write one, man, and it was like I can do this, and it w worked out great. And so then Vin started um, creating scenarios, which are very common in the copywriting world. Is like, look, I, I can't meet this guy's schedule, but why don't you do the job? I'll take a percentage to to chief you and work your ass off, and and don't blow it. And so I did that a couple times with him, and it went well. And those clients referred other people to me, and um, and that was it. it. Just snowballs from there. And then and then Carlton, of course, was my hero, and I stalked John. And as we joke, I weaseled my way into his world, and he's been an unbelievable 
mentor and resource, you know, like a, like a dad or a brother that, 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 you know, you can only dream of having. He, I can't say enough about John. He, he's, 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 a, he's an amazing person. So what are some of the um, big lessons that John Carlton taught you for those people who don't know? You know, I, I mean, a, a ton about copywriting, obviously. Um, I think I was watching uh, where you guys were chatting and talking, and he said something about, you know, saying something in five minutes more than you'll know in your, you know, more that's in your head or something, some joke that uh, he's been doing this so long that, you know, he's uh, he'll spew in five minutes of oh, what, yeah. everything you, you have in your head or something oh, yeah. like that. Yeah, we worked on a few. Well, John hired me, which was shocking to me. He actually hired me to write uh, some some copy on on one of his product launches, and so that was like a crowning achievement for me. I thought if this guy's willing to actually pay me his money, I must be doing something right. And of course, he also worked very closely with me through that process and and, and on some other jobs that he sort of achieved. And um, yeah, I'd be like banging my head against the wall to try to figure out this part of the sales letter, I'd get on the phone with John and he would spew off the top of his head, perfect copy, perfectly persuasive. He would even put in, you know, blah, 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 dot, 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 next line, uh, you know, and he's writing it in like real, he could dictate it and it would be perfect on the page. And, and I, I would just sit there and listen to him and, and, and he would stop and he'd go, what's the matter? And I'd laugh and I'd go, do you, you have any idea? Oh, the the level of torture most writers go through to achieve what you just spit out yeah. on on a Thursday afternoon at two fifteen, <laughs> you, you know it's not normal, it's not fair, you know. And so yeah, he's just a genius. And I, I'll tell you right now, uh, the, the best piece of advice John ever this this changed my career. I have it framed and it hangs on my wall. Um, it's, this is a, this is an email that John wrote to me on March 9th, two thousand and ten. That changed my career because it taught me what you know people will pay you a decent amount of money to be a vendor and write their copy but if you really want to be taken seriously and become something in this business you have to be what john calls the adult in the room uh and this is john sort of giving me permission to take chances and 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 be bold and not fear that it's going to ruin my career do you want to hear it yeah of course I've never shared this before. This wow. is an ex this is an in uh, inspired insider ins exclusive. All right, thank you for right. sharing. So this is just a, a piece of an email that I that I, I printed in frame. So he tells me you got to be the adult in the room who has more fun than everyone else, but in a responsibility centered pro code following way that earns respect and very important awe. And you never, ever blow your cover. No matter how much doubt is eating at you, you don't promise what you know you can't deliver, but you do push at the limits of your abilities. If you suspect you can do it, you lay it out there and thrive on the challenge. And if you fail, you fail spectacularly with grace and with the knowledge that it's just another step on the path with more adventures to come. Clean up the mess, make amends, brush yourself off, and get back in the saddle. Anything less than that kind of savvy cocksureness, and you're just a vendor. <laughs> All right. I mean, you can be having a friend who writes this to you in a private email. I mean, come on, man. Yeah. If you can't take that advice and do something with it, then you don't deserve success. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. That's very valuable. And, um, I want to ask you this, Kevin, too. I know you talk about a KLT sales hook. Mm -hmm. Can you tell people what that is and, and what is your KLT sales hook? Sure. So a KLT, it stands for no like, and trust. And this is something I, uh, as all great things, created on the fly <laughs> because I needed a, a lead magnet or something. And um, it's, 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 it's a simple uh, a formula that's taken from a joke formula that uh, translates into a great sales hook. So, um, and then I went on to teach it and present it and it's become a really great tool that a lot of people have used. And I just released the book, the 60 second sales hook, um, that, that Congrats. people are, thank we you. Can, yeah. Yeah. People are really enjoying it. It thrills me to be able to give, you know, what's great about it. It tricks people into writing copy. 
because people get all freaked out about writing, right? And this is just like, if you can't fill in the blanks and make this work, then I, I don't know how to help you beyond that. It, it couldn't be simpler. So uh, the KLT sales hook formula or the 60 second sales hook goes like this. The, the, let me tell you how it works for comedians and then I'll tell you how it works for, for marketers. So the joke form is what I call the persona joke formula. When the stakes are high, this is the formula most companies rely on because they, what they, the main thing they need to do is get a, a, an early laugh and they need to establish their character to the audience. So if you see a comic come on, um, you know, um, uh, Kimmel or Fallon or Letterman, um, and it's their first time on national TV, this is the type of joke they're going to do to establish who they are right off the, off the bat. Yeah, And people it's, should, by the way, people should check out your blog post about this, the Jimmy Fallon blog post that you did about his opening at uh, nice. Tonight Show, which is, was a great post. So, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's, called, it's called Jimmy Fallon's 60 Second Sales. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the same formula. So... Let me use an example of a, of, a, of a comedian named Karen Rontowski, who's famous, just hilarious. And this was her opening joke when she got her first Letterman shot. She came out and she said, my kids were so bad in Walmart today that I pulled a fly swatter off the shelf and I smacked them with it. And the minute the fly swatter hit their ass, I realized I don't have kids. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's hilarious, right? And you just learned so much about this woman uh, within the context of that joke. You realize that she doesn't have kids, that she doesn't like annoying kids, and that she's uh, there's an edge to her. But you know, right. and, and and so you, you and that she, from there, it's like you now know what to expect, and she can she can go her way. And um, so the formula there is um, 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 identity struggle discovery surprise with the joke you need that surprise at the end okay so that's all i'm i'm a single i'm a mother who is kind of like your your letter you know when you had the you said at the end that your 20 year old wrote it you know that's like the surprise of exactly of, right yes. yeah. exactly right so all joke is is a, a normal sounding story with with a crazy twist at the end for mm -hmm. the most part right mm -hmm. but you know i can't tell uh marketers and entrepreneurs and business owners hey if you can learn to create surprise, witty, creative endings to everything, you, you can have success. Like that's way too much pressure. That's a rare beast who can do that kind of thing. But what's great about that formula is if all you have to do is change that last part of it to make it a great sales hook. So for, for selling, it's identity, struggle, discovery, result, right? Because that's what we want to know is what was the result of it? Don't don't surprise me. I, I want to know that I can trust you. I want the predictable thing. Surprise me with how great the result was. Mm -hmm. So the same exact formula for me as a as a as a marketer. One I use is, um, hi, I'm Kevin Rogers. For years, uh, I struggled as a dead broke stand up comedian until I discovered how a simple joke formula could be used as um, a, a powerful marketing hook and began teaching business owners how to use it to grow their businesses. Now I'm one of the most sought after sales consultants online and working with some of the greatest marketers in the world. If you'd like to discover this simple sales formula for yourself, simply, you know, enter your email, click the button and I'll give it to you for free. Yeah. So it's the same. So now mine was identity. The struggle was I was dead broke comic. Um, the discovery was this formula how it translated from jokes to selling. And the result was I have this great career and I teach it to people and they make a bunch of money with it. And of course, and then there's the call to action. Who, who the hell doesn't want to know what that simple joke formula is? Of course, is? yes. And so- I'm a subscriber, so I could tell you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it really is cool and, it and Pete, you know what I love about it is people do it and they fill it out and it works for them. I've got tons of videos of people that put on their landing pages and different ways they've used it. I, I love that it actually, people put it to action and it works. But, um, but that's all that formula is and anybody can follow it. And it's a great formula also for telling your customer stories. You know, when you ask somebody for a testimonial, a lot of times they're willing to give it to you, but they have no idea where to start or what to write. So if you tell them, hey, if you could just quickly just say, you know, uh, your name and where you're from, what you were struggling with when you found my product or service, what it was like to work with me and, and how life is now that we've worked together. Yeah.
same formula. Now, now suddenly they they know the parameters of what to write, and you get a kick-ass testimonial. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Yeah, that is powerful. And um, I have several more questions, Kevin, but I want to respect your time. I know we're right at the hour, so I want to just make sure. Do you have a few more minutes, or you do you have to run and, and get something or do something? No, I'm good, better. Let's let's rock. Okay. Hope, hopefully, this is valuable. To oh, very valuable. Um, the I want to tie in the Tom Venuto because you talked about, um, you know, obviously the um, the KLT sales hook. What was the involvement? Of, and I mentioned the top of the interview. You know, for those of you who don't know Tom Venuto, talk about what that was and, and what you did with that. Yeah. So Tom was a uh, is a you know I love guys in the health and fitness market. Tom was a number one, uh, the top ten um seller in the clickbank health and fitness space for 10 years straight yeah. very competitive yeah very a very competitive niche uh, a lot of great copywriters and the really impressive thing about that niche even more today than than in previous years they become obsessive about their sales funnels and their conversion rates and their copywriting even guys who don't consider themselves great writers and aren't even good readers well, um, um, like a mad scientist in a lab, reverse engineer sales letters and, and funnels and figure out how these things work and get very good at writing their own. Hats off to that, to that group of guys. And Tom was one of the first to do that. Uh, he, he was smart enough to consult with John early on, John, a week of sales letter that was a, a, a classic, ugly, text-driven sales page that made Tom millions of dollars and couldn't be, he couldn't even beat it for, for seven years. He tried all different kinds of things. And he hired me uh, to try to knock it off. And he's like, give it your best shot. I don't know if you've been able to do it. He wanted you to beat his control. Beat his control. He's like, this is the ad. It, it's, it's, I haven't been able to beat it, but it's getting tired. I need something new. And, um, and good luck. <laughs> so I took the challenge. And what the, the funny thing about the Venuto story is that um, Tom is an obsessive tester and, and, and tracker of his stats, but he also hates video. He hates being on video. He hates having his picture taken. Uh, he's just so I should of, ask him for an interview. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. Yeah, I, I doubt he'd do it. He, yeah. He's a shy dude and likes to just he's very passionate, though, about health and fitness. He's a master trainer. He's transformed so many lives. It's, it's, it's impossible to count. Um, so his material was incredibly good and he was really good at putting out new articles and communicating with his list. Um, he's great at that stuff. He just doesn't want to have to come on and do the song and dance on a camera. So what, what I did was I, I wrote, I decided, Tom, you, you, this is when VSLs were just coming into vogue, and Tom hated them. And for people who don't know, it's the video sales letter. Video sales letter. Yeah. The, the kind you see, the most basic kind, where it's just words on a screen being read to you by somebody, and a, a, a few images. And, and uh, I decided halfway through writing a sales letter for Tom that it needed to be a video. And I might have forgotten to mention that to him. Why did you think that? <laughs> well, I just knew that they were converting way oh, better than gotcha. text driven. At the time, it was like, even if you had a really good text, if you turned it into video, it was going to just your conversion went through the roof. It was across the board at the time. It was such a new thing that people were getting crazy results with it. So I wrote a, a video sales letter script for Tom, and that's what I turned into him. And he... Um, I think was a little annoyed because he didn't want to make a video. So he said, well, let's just test the sales message. So he took an unformatted script and stuck it on his page as a text uh, sales letter. And so I didn't have instructions in there where to put images. It wasn't formatted with subheads. He might have done just a little of that to make it look like a sales letter. And he just wanted to see if, if it converted. And in that page beat his control wow amazingly and so he called me and i didn't know he was doing any of this and he and he called me he's like hey i want to let you know what i did i i i i took the script and i put it up as a text sales and i was like oh no that's it's totally unfair because now he's gonna he's like judge well, you off it. of that yeah. exactly and and he's like well it it, it won 
And I was like, oh, my God. I said, well, dude, this is exciting because I promise you when we turn this into a, a video, it's going to it's going to double what we're getting now. And it did. And so it, it really added a lot of fuel to his fire. And Tom's such a great author and such an, uh, an expert in what he does. Um, a, a major publisher ended up paying a, a lot of money to buy the rights to burn the fat, feed the muscle. And so currently, I don't even think he's on ClickBank. And because he certainly doesn't need the money, but I'm sure he'll be back and, and doing more great stuff. But uh, yeah, so that was a really rewarding experience. So what did you include? In, obviously, I'm going to ask, what did you include in that that you think worked? Um, I, 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 well, there was input from John, and that certainly played a role. Um, I think what worked was I... I uh, made the the message a little more visceral than what he had. Um, for him, it, it was a lot about the facts and the science about why this was going to work and why you needed to build muscle as you lost weight. Otherwise, so was it was it like a, about an exercise program? Yeah, it, it was it was just an ebook, but it was mostly about nutrition. But there, there was some really cool stuff in there that he wasn't touching on at all about um, um, body types that I found fascinating. And so I included a, a section on, on body types and how you have to feed and, and work your body based on there are there is something to the genetics. You're, you're born with a certain frame and you need to respect that and, and behave accordingly if you want results. I think that helped. And um, I really brought home the emotional um, sort of, you know, humiliation of realizing that you, you look like crap. <laughs> and that at the time, Facebook and social media was was becoming very prominent. And so I said I wrote something about, you know, everybody's posting pictures of you on Facebook, whether you like it or not. And how many times have you looked at a photo somebody took and you're mortified and you just want to, you know, delete it and get rid of it? Well, you know, and because, yeah. and, you know, what I realized was, you know, what people you, you see this all the time. If you take a group photo or you take a selfie with somebody if there's a woman in it, they always grab the camera and they look immediately and they're not looking at anybody else. They're just making sure their hair was right or their chin was up. And, you know, they're like, ah, delete it. Let's do it again. So I realized like that's bring people into that moment. Where How did you know that, though? Because you're a skinny, you know, fine looking guy. You wouldn't even think about that. Uh, I mean, everybody has their own insecurity. Everybody has that part on their body that they want to, you know, cover and. And plus, you know, I, you, you observe how other people are, are behaving. And, you know, I would see particularly women always, they were the, the ones who would go, oh, delete that, take it over. Yeah. And I'm thinking, wow, they're so traumatized by, you know, and so for, for a lot of, especially for guys, you, we don't think as much about our appearance until you see a picture. And it's just an instinct to, to judge how you're looking. And if you're not happy, you might be surprised, like, wow, when did I get the double chin? You know, like, I got to, I got to do something here. So my device was to bring people into that moment and, and remind them about feeling humiliated and go, because that's the immediate, when you see that and you feel that, your immediate thought is, man, I got to do something. Yeah. And so, but if you're sitting there reading, a, watching a VSL, it, you're, it's easy to, you're just looking for well, why it won't work. I wanted to bring people into that moment where they yeah. got back in touch with that humiliation. That's yeah. the real motivation. Yeah. You really tapped into people's pain. Yeah. Um, so what's a campaign that didn't work? Well, I mean, it happens, you know, um, a campaign. I had one recently where it was painful because we just we dotted every I and crossed every T in pre-launch. It tested well and then it went out to affiliate traffic and um, it just didn't do as well as is we expected and as as much as the affiliates would have liked for it to. And um, and the guy pulled the campaign and it was painful because you re you really think and every copywriter will tell you this. You, you, you can test things to death and you put it out into the world and you just never know. You just never know what's going to happen. You know, it's like the Olympics. You, you, you can work 14 hours a day for four years straight, but it all comes down to that moment. Yeah, that's a good like analogy. You fall on the that's ice. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes you fall on the ice, man, even though you've done it a million. And so. You know, uh, and, and that just is always going to happen. And it's part of the business. And, and, and the people, the marketers who really survive and thrive are the ones who can take that swing and take that hit and not let it upend their world and go, all right, let's tweak it. Let's test it again. Let's make some changes. You got to regroup fast. You know, like Gary Halbert used to say, 
fail often, fail, you know, a lot and fail off and fail fast because the failures are what lead to the, the consistent success. And if you're not willing to go through those failures, you'll, you'll never get to, to true success. So what was it that didn't work that you found didn't work? Because obviously if someone like you who's an expert copywriter doesn't yeah. work, we're all doomed. But what, what didn't work with it? That's a good question. It's like it, in, unless you really test all the elements and find out where people are dumping out of the video, where they're getting turned off on the page, unless, we didn't really get to do that testing. And that's why I regret a little that the campaign was pulled. I, th I think we could have turned it around over the launch period. Um, but it, it could be so many elements. Uh, it, it could be uh, the way the person read the VSL, the voiceover, if they didn't relate to the person. It could be that the, the promise wasn't big enough. You have to push the envelope with what you're promising what you, your product can do. Um, I think it, it was it was it missed the mark in terms of the the USP, the unique selling proposition of the hook. It didn't have a very clear um, do this and expect this in this amount of time. Um, you know, it, again, one of those simple things that you that's on your checklist that you it's easy to oversee if you get too distracted telling a different story, right? Mm -hmm. So, the big lesson is. Have a checklist of ways an ad can go bad and never let it out the door until you check off every one of those things. You know, never make assumptions. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. it, it, it converted really well to this guy's in-house list because they knew him and they resonated with him. But outside of his little universe, people weren't, I, I think, resonating with him or the message. Mm -hmm. And that was the difference. Yeah. And, you know, Kevin, you've been so generous with your time. I probably could talk to you for another three hours with 100 more questions. I'm going to keep it to two. And because yeah. I want to hear some of your favorite headlines of all time. Ah, that's some great ones. Um, you know, I, I for headlines, I tend to go back to the old um, mail days and, and the print ad days. And the reason is uh, you talk about having to get it right. I mean, a very expensive proposition. We take for granted now that we can pump out and test five or 10 headlines over a couple of days, if we have the traffic flow, that's an unbelievable ability. These guys used to have to give it their best shot, mail it out and wait a week or two to see if it worked right. or not. Man. Right. So um, headlines that became stalwarts and controls for years back in the mail days, you know they worked. And because <laughs> there was a lot of money. They had to pay money, yeah, tons of yep. money, yeah. Stakes were high. So um, I think my favorite headline of all time has to be John Carlton's one-legged golfer headline. What I love about it is there's a lot of lessons within uh, that headline. People get confused sometimes about the difference between a hook and a headline. Um, hooks are a, a tricky thing because you can have a hook within a headline and you can have a hook of a product. And so, you know, hook is not sort of a universally understood piece of terminology, right? Um, but what I love about this headline is there's a great hook within the headline that hooks you into reading more to finding out what the hell's going on with a one-legged golfer. But the real hook of the product and the promise is everything else in the headline. So let me read you the headline and we'll talk a little bit about why it's great. So the, the um, pre-headline says, want to slash strokes from your game almost overnight. This is for golfers. And the headline is, Amazing secret discovered by one-legged golfer adds 50 yards to your drives, eliminates hooks and slices, and can slash up to 10 strokes from your game almost overnight. Sign okay. me up, yeah. That's it. I mean, but what is, what is really going on here, unless you want to uh, add 50 yards, slash 10 strokes, and show off for your buddies... Um, there's, there's, there's no reason to read here, but even if you've been promised things like that before, you might be, um, uh, immune, you're skeptical, to, yeah. skeptical and you're, you're unimpressed, but now you add a one-legged golfer <laughs> into the mix and, and, and it's an amazing secret discovered by a one-legged golfer. How can you not, if you have any interest in achieving this promise, read on to find out what the yeah. hell's going on here? And so it, that's he what uses the combination then of your your sales hook comedy and your in your sales hook with the result and the surprise, right? 
Pretty much yeah. all, all in one headline in the yeah, this, well, the, the surprise is more in this case what John would call an incongruous juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. uh, a one legged golfer doesn't add up. And so it creates a curiosity that you have to follow through. Mm -hmm. And so it is discovered by the one legged golfer. But now you need to go discover what it is about this one legged golfer that could make it work. Right. And so what, what's another great lesson about this? as a marketer and a copywriter, another thing I teach people is to dig deeper than they ever have about why they're selling their product. What's the story? Where did all this begin? Because when you're in tune with that for yourself, that's when you may not tell that story word for word directly, but if you know it and it's inherent in what you're writing, people will feel that and it will have a much greater effect because they'll understand that there's some meat behind why this exists, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the one-legged golfer thing uh, came from the client. It's a true story. John was on the phone for 45 minutes with the guy getting not a lot of great stuff. And John finally said, well, let's go back to the beginning. Like, how did you discover what he calls this triple coil technique? Where did it begin? The guy's like, ah, oh, you know, I've told the story a million times. There was a one-legged golfer on the course, and the guy was driving the ball. And John's like, whoa, 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 <laughs> back up. Did you did you say one-legged golfer? And the guy's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one. He's like, whoa. whoa. <laughs> so you know, here's the guy who thought everybody's heard this story. Nobody cares anymore because you know he tells it at every party and people roll their eyes. We've heard it, Tom. You know, um, but John knew. Holy smokes, this is copywriting gold. And so, and, you know, knew immediately that that would be in the headline. So the lesson is dig deep. If you're a freelancer, really dig deep with your clients. People love talking about themselves, by the way, and they love telling the story of how their product came to be um, and do it for yourself. Have somebody interview you um, in, in, in like this and, and, and record that and, you know, find out why the hell what's interesting. What is the story behind what yeah. you're selling? And if you can tell that story, yeah. I promise your, your conversions will increase. Yeah. I mean, my mind, when you're, you're talking, you know, you talk about the comic and I'm like, like lessons from a bellhop or, you know, like all my mind's going, there's a million things, you know, that, that came up in this conversation that I wouldn't even have thought. Yeah. Like, yeah, like the, the, the real, the real way, um, hotel bellmen make money that can add, you know, 10%, uh, mm -hmm. increase your sales by 10% overnight. Mm -hmm. Right. So, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted you to talk about where people should go to find more about you, but I want to ask, I have to ask about, you know, when I asked you uh, about a big roadblock, you, um, which I would never have guessed, um, talked about uh, heart surgery. That's right. Yeah. What, what, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? That's, I would never That's have guessed that. Yeah, it's a big story. It's, it's actually in the book, The 60 Second Sales Hook. I, I tell the whole story. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll shorten it here. Essentially what happened was, and this is another you know, great lesson in that life's going to throw crap your way, man. Nobody gets an easy ride here. It's all about resilience you know, and, and having support and people around you who are, are willing to help you through it. Um, I, I just woke up with what I thought was a flu one day back in 2005. I had a high fever and it wasn't going away. And this went on for weeks and I just was really sick and had a high fever and didn't understand what it was. And I didn't have, um, I, 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 I just signed up for health insurance and I didn't have a regular GP. I was still in the, in the, uh, probation period. So I, I was not in the flow of going to see a doctor when I had a problem. Right. So I just kept thinking, ah, it'll go away. It's typical Healthy. male, yeah. Typical male, ah, fine, you know, put some, rub some whiskey on it, it'll be fine. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and um, uh, it didn't go away. And so uh, um, I finally went to a doctor and it was misdiagnosed. He thought I had a thing called temporal arteritis, which can cause you to go blind if you don't take steroids. Wow. So I took a bunch of steroids and Normally, that would make you um, blow up and bloat. Instead, I was losing weight. And so I had this onset of diabetes. I was just very sick. And I finally went down, passed out, woke up in the hospital. Jeez. And a specialist uh, quickly determined that I had a blood infection, probably brought on from a dental visit, a dental cleaning, because I had a heart murmur. And um, if you have a heart murmur, and this is a, I could save lives here. 
never take lightly the fact that you need to medicate with antibiotics before any dental appointment no. if you have a heart murmur. It's no joke. In general, and, yeah, they recommend. Yeah. I just did this a few weeks ago. They made me go on this course of antibiotics, yeah. Yeah, it's really critical. And you just think, ah, it'll be fine. You know what got me was I was already on an, I knew to medicate, but I was already on an antibiotic. And I stupidly thought, what's the difference? So I said to the hygienist, hey, listen, I'm already taking an antibiotic for a head cold or something. Um, and, and is it, do I need, she goes, nah, it's all the same. She didn't know either. Well, she's making nine bucks an hour to, to walk me back to the chair, you know? Um, so you, you just, you have to take responsibility for your own health. That's, that's a great message here. So anyway, it turned out that, it, you know, we tried to kill it with, 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 with I had a, a pick line and a drip and I was wearing a, 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 a little motorized bag that would shoot. He was penicillin into my, on, right onto my heart, wow. you know, every two hours, this intense uh, attempt at, 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 at recovering and it was just not happening. So it was determined that I would need open heart surgery to replace my mitral heart valve. Wow. And um, yeah, that's a, that's a sobering moment. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I joke that if you've never had a near-death experience, I highly recommend it. Um, right. It, it really wakes you up. To Only the comic can joke about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, hey, man, it, it'll, it'll force you to get your priorities straight quick. When you actually... So I, how did it change you? Um, well, the, the, the simplest thing it did was it put me on a, uh, it made me much more in tune with my physical being. And, um, I, I see a doctor very regularly now. Um, I get checkups. I try not to let little things, a skin tag or something, go get it checked, man. You know, it could, you don't know what it could be. And the other positive of it was I'd always gone up and down in weight and kind of worked out, but it was it ate like crap. Um, and it planted a seed because you have to go to physical therapy to recover from heart surgery. It's pretty daunting. And I, I never stopped regularly going to, to a gym since then, you know, so I'm in better physical health than I ever was before it happened. Um, and, uh, so I think it was a gift. The only drag about it is that I need, I'll be on blood thinners, um, for life. And if I, if any, supernatural disaster happened where I couldn't get that medicine, I'd, I'd be dead pretty quickly. Really? That, 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 still, yeah. Still today? Yeah, oh yeah. I'll be, because I have a metal heart valve. Oh, if it was no. a pig valve, um, you don't need the blood thinners, but um, they typically only last 15 to 20 years. Hopefully I would outlive that. And so with a metal valve, you have to control your international rate. And so oh. I'll be on warfarin, uh, rat poison essentially, wow. forever um, to keep that in check. So I hate the fact that there's a medicine that I need to survive. Um, um, uh, but, you know, and, it, you know, I asked a, a heart doctor recently, go, what, what, what really went on here? What did I lose? He goes, yeah. He goes, um, you know, you lost some years. He goes, you know, compared to somebody who takes as good care of themselves as you do, um, they're going to live longer than, than you, you're going to because of this. He said, but the good news is you're uh, in much better shape than most people and you'll probably outlive them. <laughs> so you, you take right. it for what it is right. and um, you, it reminds you to make the most of the time that you do get here. And I could have I been dead. I was hours from death. This is, wow. I'm, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm living the second chance, man. Yeah. August 1st every year is my second birthday. You know, I, I, I had a two-year-old kid at the time. I'll never forget my wife driving me to the hospital and it, I just felt the life draining from my body. Ugh. And I, my two-year-old kid was in the back seat. And I just remember looking back at him and staring at him and going, I've, I've left nothing. I've left nothing for this kid and this family. And, you know, without that moment of, of sobering reality and um, a new determination to really make things happen, I probably wouldn't have created this career. So yeah. it's a blessing. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, sharing that. This, this interview is a blessing in my mind and um, I have one last question but before I ask it just tell people where they can find out more what are you working on now what's exciting so I can uh, link all the your good stuff up in the in the uh, post sure um, so the best place to go is my main uh, blog is um, the copywriters edge.com I love to post there a lot of um, not just copywriting stuff, life stuff, always related back to sales, but pretty candid 
the way we've been here. Right. Um, uh, my book, which I'm happy for people to grab a free download on, it's also available on Amazon, but it's called um, The 60 Second Sales Hook. So the website there is 60, the number 60, uh, 60secondsaleshook.com. Um, and I love for them to go download the book. Uh, I don't promote to that list other people's products. You're not going to get a bunch of spam or crap, but I will engage with you as much as you'd like because uh, I love having the dialogue with people who I can help best. So yeah. if you download that book and read it and you uh, respond to my emails, that's really me and I'd be happy to, to yeah. talk and help you out. It's very valuable. I'm a subscriber. And also you have a podcast. That's right, with John Carlton, which is just a blast. It's called um, Psych Insights from Modern Marketers. You can find it on iTunes and Stitcher, and also the, you can get it at the website, which is pi the number four mm dot com. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we we put out new episodes uh, every two or three weeks. And you know, the rule for that for John and I is we'll keep doing this as long as it doesn't start to suck or become stressful. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And we have a lot of fun and people, I think we you have some tell. of the highest engagement of any yeah. um, podcast. People really lay, lay out some thick responses in our comment section. So that's a great read there too as well. Yeah. And so my last question, Kevin, is so I have a lot of pressure with uh, interviewing copywriters. What should uh, the headline be for this when I post it? Oh, man. Wow, you put me on the spot. <laughs> We've covered so much. Um I'll go back and listen to this, but um, yeah. I know that you know people spend you know eighty percent of their time or whatever on the headline. So I figured yeah. a few tidbits I'll from pressure. you. Um, well, let's use like a one-legged golfer. How how a how a um, well use my sixty-second sales hook. How how a dead broke stand-up comic um, you know manipulated a joke formula into a million-dollar sales hook. And, and, and how you can do the same or something yeah. like that. All right. I love it. And uh, I expect to see you on a Mike and Molly episode at some point also. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Kevin, so much. I really appreciate your time. It's been wonderful chatting with you. Yeah, it's a real good time, Jeremy. I love your, love your show and uh, all the best to you, buddy. Thanks. All right, man. See you.